Let us pray. Dear kind of merciful Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come before you once again. We ask, Lord, that as we prepare to get started and to teach your children, that you lead us, guide us, and teach us. Give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding from on high. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Saints, I'll tell you, it seems like it has been forever since the last time we were together. However, I hope all of you would have had a chance to go over the lectures that we have out there. And if you have had a chance to go over, you would find that your understanding concerning the topics that was being discussed would have been extremely clear. As a matter of fact, going into tonight's lecture, you'll be amazed to see how much more you grasp the depth of this lecture. Uh, remember, the last time we were here, uh, we actually ended on this screen. But I'm going back one screen to start at the anatomy of a grain. So in starting with the anatomy of a grain, there's some basic principles that you need to keep in mind. Remember that a grain consists of three basic parts. The grain consists of the bran, it consists of the endosperm, and it also consists of the germ. Uh, when you keep that in mind, you will know that, you know, it talks about um, the, the Lord, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, they have basically, basically their footprint, or you can say handprint, on everything that they have created. You can also look at it from a sanctuary standpoint. You can look at the outer courts, the holy place, and the holy of holies. Um, so... Uh, the, what's amazing is that you can actually see the footprint of our Father in basically everything in creation. Well, there's a reason why we have this anatomy of the grain up. Like, as you see here with the bran, the bran is where, you know, if some people are wondering, I don't know if you ever beat raisin bran or bran flakes, you know, or oat bran. This is the outer portion. This is where the fiber is. Okay, we're going to break that down. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have ever eaten these gluten-like steaks um, or have heard about gluten. Gluten now is the protein that is found in the endosperm. It is found in the inner portion of the grain. This is where we tend to have our white flour, our white rice, our white item. That is the endosperm, the inner portion of the grain. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever had um, fish, you know, pet fish when you were small, where you'd actually feed those pet fish like wheat germ. Um, well, that, this is where that comes from. This is the germ. This is where... The, the plant germinate from. This is where it sprouts from, uh, a, a, an area that is highly nu nutritious because this is a part that actually powers the growth of that plant. Okay? There are toxic elements in the brand of grain, such as phytic acid and in nuts, such as um, polyphenols, which we need to give special attention. Phytates are the salts of phytic acid. It is the storage form of phosphorus in a plant. Now, saints, this section, as I mentioned to you, is rather interesting. It's also an extremely sweet, sweet area to teach. As a matter of fact, let me start off by telling some stories. And as I share the stories, we're going to get deeper and deeper. As a matter of fact, you know how I like to say, it gets gooder and gooder as the time progresses. Um, I remember um, Dr. Agatha Trash, the late Dr. Agatha Trash, um, she had made some statements, and 
um, she was doing a lecture, and I, I was kind of intrigued by the statements she made. She used a term called lacuna scars, lacuna scars. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that term before, but some of you may have heard that term, and some of you may not have heard of that term, lacuna scars. And here's what they did. They were doing some research, and they found that individuals over the age of 30, they had scar tissues on the brain. When they went and checked the scar tissues to, ch to check and see what caused these scar tissues on the brain, the cause was found to be on the cook, or you can say on the prepared brains. For example, um, uh, oats was a primary contributor to the scars on the brain. Rice was a primary contributor to the scars on the brain. And basically, you can even put beans in that category too because beans are actually a type of grains. Beans are actually called legume grains. A lot of the time you'll find individuals say, oh, when I cook my beans, it gives me so much gas. Well, the reason for that, I should say one of the reasons for that is basically it's because your beans probably have not been cooked long enough, okay? So we're going to get into that this evening, and we're going to break this thing wide open. Uh, I'm going to go on to another, some more information here. I, I shared with you a little about lacuna scars, the, uh, in terms of the scar tissues on the brain. When grains... Um, and grain items aren't cooked properly or long enough, it actually causes scar tissues on the brain. Well, I want to share my own personal testimony uh, when it comes to issues with on the cooked grains. Uh, let me start by telling you, uh, years ago, I went to the U.S. Virgin Islands um, I actually went over to St. Thomas, and I went to one of the largest churches there on St. Thomas. While at that church, I was doing a series of lecture, and one of the senior pastors came up to me, and he says, Brother Luke, can I ask you a question? You, you know, I said, Pastor, of course, how may I serve you? Pastor says, Brother Luke, here's the thing. Um, I've been to doctors. Nobody can answer this question. He says, I get like mini strokes um, and uh, no one has been able to tell me what is the cause of these mini strokes. So I sat Pastor down and I went through a series of questions. Uh, I said, you know, Pastor, are you hypertensive? He says, no, I'm not. You, you know, and just kind of, Pastor, do you have allergies? You know, I, I went through a series of questions trying to examine pastor to see what could possibly be the situation. After I got done, I said, okay, pastor, I honestly feel that I think I know what your problem is. Um, it's very likely that you may have issues with undercooked grains. I said, can I ask you a question? Do you eat any raw grain like oats or anything along that line? You know, a lot of times people are making smoothies or making these special drinks, and they are quick to put oats in these drinks. He says, Brother Luke, every morning when I make my smoothie, he says, I put raw oats in my smoothie. I said, Pastor, that is the culprit. That is the cause of the mini strokes that you have been getting. So immediately I told Pastor that he actually needed to, to bake the oats at the lowest possible temperature for at least the three hours. And if he baked it at that low temperature, low, slow, continuous heat for at least three hours, let it cool. When it cool, put it back in its container, and he can then use it in his smoothie. He will not have any problem after that. Now, saints, listen. As I shared with you, the lowest possible temperature, 
when you do, the, do it the way that I'm suggesting, the color of the oats will not change externally. The changes would have occurred internally. What would have been destroyed is that item that's called phytic acid. Okay? What would have destro been destroyed is that thing that's called phytic acid. That's why when you look at many of the people out there that is talking about grains, grains are bad and, um, you know, it, 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 they don't digest properly, they're anti-nutritive, they, they cause anemia. This is the reason why you see they're making such statements. They are research that comes out and say that if you eat bread, whole wheat bread, um, it can cause anemia. And now saints, it makes sense because as long as you have not destroyed the phytic acid, it becomes anti-nutritive. Well, I went ahead and I shared the information with Pastor, and Pastor began doing the oats the way I suggested. About two years later, I went back to St. Thomas, and I visited Pastor. Pastor and I ran into each other, and I said, Pastor, how art thou? He said, Brother Luke, thou art fine. I said, Pastor, since the last time I left here, have you had any more of those mini strokes um, that you are having when you were eating the oats, the, the, um, um, have you, let me back up. I said, Pastor, have you had any of those mini strokes that you used to have in the past since you have started preparing the oats the way I suggested? He says, Brother Luke, I have not had one since. Now, saints, if you guys are believing that that was by accident, let me just share another one. And saints, I can keep on going and and giving you testimonies upon testimonies. You, you know, because one of the things that I love, I love stories. I love a good testimony. And when folks begin to talk, I believe that the reason why God gave us two ears and one mouth is that we can listen twice as much as we speak. So one of the things that you'll find is that I love to listen, especially when it's a great testimony coming back, a testimony that I can use for future situations. Now, let me share with you another testimony. I remember I was in Atlanta, Georgia. While in Atlanta, Georgia, I was in the Buckhead region. And any of you guys who have been to Atlanta and you're familiar with the Buckhead area, you know that in Buckhead, everything goes there. That, that they will have the finest vegan restaurant, raw restaurant, you name it, they would have it there. Um, I visited a vegan restaurant. As a matter of fact, the name of the restaurant was called Vegan Way. And while I was there, I, pulled, I saw they had like a little thing on the counter where you can put your business card in, where you can get like a free lunch. I'm like, okay, great. I would like to have a free lunch one day because this is the, the lifestyle I live. I pulled my business card out to drop it in to get a free lunch. The lady said, excuse me, one second. Let me see that card. And I showed her my car. She says, oh, you're into health, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. How may I serve you? She says, I have a question for you. Now, saints, this woman was absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, you can tell that she was seasoned. And I'll, and I'll explain to you what I mean. She says, I have a question for you. She says, how can someone who has been vegan for over 30 years have stroke-like, mini stroke-like symptoms, you, you know, and let me tell you what I mean by this young lady is absolutely brilliant. She knew that with the diet that she was on, those arteries should look like that of a child. They should be so clear that those arteries should look like that of a child. So when she said, how can someone being a vegan for over 30 plus years have stroke-like symptoms? She said, doesn't make any sense. Can you explain to me? And, you know, I asked her the same little question. Are you hypertensive? Are you on medication? Do you have allergies, sinus? And, nope. Clean as a whistle. I said, amen. I said, can I ask one last question? Do you eat raw grains such as oats and things along that line? Lo and behold, she pulled a bag of oats from behind her back. And she says, every morning I eat a portion of this. I looked her square in the eye and I said, my dear, that is the culprit. 
And I began to explain to her that grains used for porridge or mush should have several hours cooking. As a matter of fact, that is a direct quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. You know, one of the things that I found in studying the writings of Sister Ellen G. White, she would make some simple statements. And just like in the Bible, for the average person, if you are, if you're not looking, these simple statements will bypass you. And I saw that statement where it says, grains used for porridge or mush should have several hours cooking. So you looked up the you, you look up the, 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 the word several. Now come on, saying several is a word that we use on a daily basis. But I decided I want to get a proper definition for it. And I looked up the definition for the word several, and it says more than two, but not many. So one of the things that I realized is that when you are cooking grains, your grains need to be cooked for a minimum of at least three hours. Three hours minimum is one. And as I dug deeper and deeper back in the days of Sister Ellen G. White, I recognized that the harder the grain, the longer they cooked it for. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a few individuals from Africa, and one of the things that individuals told me from Africa, they said that their grandparents would put the, the, the beans on, uh, I'm sorry, not the beans, the corn, because corn is basically considered the hardest grain. They'll put that dry corn on early afternoon, maybe about anywhere, maybe about 1, 12, 1, you know, maybe the latest 2, somewhere around there. And they'll cook it all afternoon long. And then maybe about 6 o'clock or somewhere around that time, that's the time they'll make it available for the family to use. So you'll find that in Africa, they would cook that corn anywhere between 4 to 6, maybe 7, seven uh, maybe 7 hours they'll cook that corn for. And as you dig deeper and deeper and you look back in the older days, I recognize that dry corn used to cook for a very long time. Sister Nash, Brother Farley, and I, we, all, we have the documentation. We have the research. We can show you what, how long folks used to cook corn for back in the old days. You'll be amazed to see how long they cooked that corn for. And it ain't no three hours. They cook it for way longer than that three hours. So it makes sense when Sister White make the statement, grains used for porridge or mush should have several hours cooking. Let, let's continue here now. Phytic acid. It says phytic acid combines with calcium, magnesium, copper, iron, and zinc in the intestinal tract to block the absorption into the body. In this form, the compound is referred to as phytate. Now, saints, you, you know, this is so deep, you know, because... As you look out there, you hear something called the paleo diet. You know, paleo is on to something, but paleo does not fully understand what is taking place because he does not have a seer, doesn't have a prophetess. We, as a Seventh-day Adventist, we have a seer. We have the ability to see through dark areas because of the fact of what God has granted us through the gift of Sister Ellen G. White. Um, and I'll tell you guys something. It's amazing. So when I first, uh, let me back, when Sister Nash, Brother Farley, and I first got this information, it took years before we got the research to support what we were teaching. As a matter of fact, if you look right here, this research came out in 2003. Saints, I was studying these things way before then, before then, and I did not have access to the information at that time. As I was studying and reading, I have the, the information, the spirit of prophecy, but the research was not 
out in an environment where I could um, utilize it or have access to it at that time. Um, where can we find phytates? Phytates are found in the bran or hull of grains, okay, roughly between 200 to 800 milligrams per 100 edible gram. Beans, nuts, seeds, um, provision, that's your tubers, um, and trace amounts of certain fruits and vegetables like berries and green beans. Now, saints, let me share this with you. You're going to see how the Lord is wise in terms of the statement he used. Like, for example, in nuts, when you deal with nuts, it's, it, the, the, the quote comes, care should be taken, however, not to use too large a portion of nuts. Y you know, and so, th these are simple statements. And you're like, why, Lord? Why? W wh why care should be taken, however, not to use too large a portion of nuts? Why? Because nuts are higher, even higher in phytic acid. So the Lord says, hey, do, do me a favor. You can eat the nuts raw. You know, there's a lot of people out there soaking nuts and all these different things. They don't understand. They lack understanding. Um, you can eat the nuts raw. The reason why you can eat the nuts raw, because of the high amount of phytic acid nuts have, as we go further on in the study, you'll find that phytic acid in large quantity should be destroyed, but in smaller quantity should be saved because it's an antioxidant. You know, it's amazing. Small quantity, antioxidant, the body can handle up to 400 milligrams daily. Large quantity, it's anti-nutritive, it stops the absorption of nutrients. So the key is, it's finding balance when dealing with phytic acid. Um, and that's why in the spirit of prophecy, it talks about, listen to this, proper preparation and proper combination. So it's not just understanding how to combine the, the foods together, but it's also understanding how to prepare the food so in that way you'll have proper nutrients coming from the food. Do we need phytates? As a matter of fact, saints, if you go to the health food store today, you will, you, you'll be blown away. You see this thing called IP6, inositol hexaphosphate, they sell that um, at the health food store, and it is very expensive. You know what that is? That is that same phyta phytic acid, or you can say phytates, um, that comes from the outer portion of grains that is used to destroy cancer cells. Now, says, can you understand why we need to go plant-based? Because going plant-based, just automatically eating grains and beans and nuts and seeds, automatically fight cancer cells because of what is in the grain, just dealing with the outer portion of the grain alone. Phytates, IP6, or inositol hexaphosphate, provide us with antioxidants and are anti-carcinogenic. Humans, however, can tolerate a small amount of phytic acid per day in the amount of 100 milligrams to 400 milligrams daily, okay? And that research came out back in 1985. Since, as, as you're watching, are you seeing us putting this thing together? And you're going to understand why Sister White made certain statements as she made. There's a lot of statements that are made in the spirit of prophecy. They are simple, but they are deep. Like I mentioned to you guys before, th that military person who met me in California that said to me, Brother Luke, do you know the deepest part of the ocean? I looked that soldier square in his eye, and I said, no, sir. He says, Brother Luke, the deepest part in the ocean is called the Meridian Straits. So, saints, what we are teaching tonight is as deep as the Meridian Straits. Let's continue. What is phytase? Now, saints, let me show you something. You, you got to see the difference. There is a difference. Okay? You have phytates. Listen to this. Phytates. Watch this now. And you now have phytase. 
Do you see the difference there? So the, the ASE lets you know it's an enzyme. Okay? Brother Farley, Sister Nash, I need you to do me a favor real quick here. Um, uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, to, 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 let me see. Let me see if it's here. Okay. I need you to do me a favor. I need you to do me a favor. Sister Nash, Brother Farley, I need you guys to do me a favor. favor. Yeah. Type, type up in the spirit of prophecy real quick and type in the word rye. R Y E. Okay? And let me tell you what I'm looking for. There's a quote in the Spirit of Prophecy where Sister White says, Whenever you're making um, certain, like bread or certain things, she says, Combine it with a little rye flour. Find that quote for me. Sister Nash, I think I sent that to you a while back, but I didn't see it here in the presentation. Just look that up for me. I'm going to show you guys something tonight. Um. Tell yeah, me when you. Well, there's one in Conscious and Diets and Foods, uh, page three twenty one, that talks about it being more nutritious than the wheat. Yes, re read it for me, Sister Nash. All wheat flour is not best for a continuous diet. A mixture of wheat, oatmeal, and rye would be more nutritious than the wheat with the nutrifying properties separated from it okay so 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 re repeat that one more time again sister nash for the folks who are listening because i'm going to explain to the folks them what is taking place right here read that one more time okay it's coming from councils on diets and foods page 321 article 506 it says all wheat flour is not best for a continuous diet a mixture of wheat Oatmeal and rye would be more nutritious than the wheat with the nutrifying properties separated from it. Okay, thank you, Sister Nash. Now, Saints, you, you, you hear that statement. Again, sounds simple, but the statements are highly scientific, highly scientific. Okay, and I'm going to break that down for you as we go through our lecture. Remember that quote that Sister Nash just read, and I'm, I'm going to show you something. You remember, remember the word phytase, A-S-E, which lets you know it's a what? Enzyme. Enzyme is what we're dealing with. So it says here, an enzyme that coexists in plant foods that contain phytic acid. It is the enzyme that neutralizes, neutralizes phytic acid and releases phosphorus. So basically, saints, what we're learning here, in the same grain that has the phytic acid, God has put an enzyme in that same grain to help neutralize, listen good, to help neutralize the phytic acid to release the phosphorus and to actually give you access to the other nutrients. Are you with me so far? Okay. Let me tell you what I mean by other nutrients. Remember we talked about whenever phytic acid is present, it prevents calcium, magnesium, copper, iron, zinc, okay? And also to something uh, you'll find later on, it also stops carbohydrate and protein from being absorbed, okay? So whenever phytic acid is not put in check, it becomes anti-nutritive, okay? Um, listen to this now. Not all grains contain enough phytase to eliminate the phytate. You see the difference? Phytase is the enzyme. Phytate or phytic acid is the problem we have in, even when properly prepared, okay? So they're telling you here, not all grains contain enough of the enzyme phytase to eliminate the phytate even when properly prepared. Okay, watch this. For example, corn, millet, oats, brown rice do not contain sufficient phytase to eliminate all the phytic acid they contain. It is for this reason 
that proper food preparation is important to lower the phytic acid content. And the proper food preparation, listen good now. Saints, listen to me. Low, slow, continuous heat. Why low? Because if you raise the temperature above 100, I think it's 170 degrees, you destroy phytase, which is the enzyme. Okay? Um, and so you want it to be low, slow, continuous heat. That's why we do not use pressure cookers. That's why pressure cookers is not good for your preparation of your beans, your preparation of your grains, or in any form of our cooking. Pressure cooking, pressure cooking is a no-no. Am I making sense, things? Okay? And you're going to see in a minute why some things we don't do. Phytase and ruminant animals. Ruminant animals produce large amount of phytase in their gut and have no trouble to digest phytate rich foods. Ruminant animals such as what? Cows, goat, sheep, deer, buffalo, bison, those four stomach species, they have no problem because of the amount of phytase that they produce. Their four compartment stomach is designed to, to digest coarse plant matter. Non-ruminant or monogastric animals, we're talking human beings now, such as humans, dogs, and pigs, have a simple single-chamber stomach and produces far less phytase, which is the enzyme necessary for the breaking down of phytic acid in food. Okay? So it lets you know that we as human beings, we don't produce adequate level of the enzyme to actually break down the phytic acid in food. And by doing that, you'll find that if you eat whole grain products, you'll all of a sudden find that you start becoming maybe deficient in certain nutrients. And you're like, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. I'm eating whole plant foods eaten whole, and all of a sudden I'm still becoming deficient. I'm anemic. How can I be anemic and I'm eating so good? Proper preparation, proper combination is the key behind it. And now, saints, that's why. Now, saints, listen good. This is why when individuals say, Brother Luke, can you just give me a quick answer? Give me a quick answer. How can I fix this situation? You just give me a quick answer. No, answers can't come that quick. Think about it. If we're dealing with a simple situation like anemia, you know, you know, someone says, just give me some blood builders. No. Let me find out what you're doing wrong. Or you're preparing your food improperly. That is, prob that is probably causing the anemia. Or do you have issues such as leaky gut or something called SIBO or C4, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or small intestinal fungal overgrowth? Maybe because you're eating your bread too soon. Like, for example, there are people that as soon as the bread is finished baked, they go right ahead and eat the bread where the yeast germ is still alive, and all of a sudden, they get something called small intestinal fungal overgrowth. That's why the servant of the Lord says that any time you make bread, you need to wait at least two to three days before you can eat that bread so that the yeast germ shall be destroyed. Saints, it, it, this thing is so deep. It's amazing as, um, as we keep digging. Now listen to this. Phytase is destroyed during food preparation. Phytase is destroyed by steaming heat at about 176 degrees Fahrenheit in 10 minutes or less. So you'll find, saints, that once you get that temperature up, I'd mentioned 170, 176. Once you get that temperature up to about 176 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, automatically you destroy all of the phytase. This is the enzyme that is used to neutralize phytic acid in the food. Um, and that's why we mentioned to you low, slow, continuous heat. And if you can keep that temperature below that 176, you will not destroy the, the enzyme that is in that food 
to aid with the neutralization of phytic acid in the large quantity of, uh, of grains or, or, or beans or items it, it will be found in um, uh, for that specific meal. Um, and it lets you know here that in 10 minutes or less, it is destroyed. Now, in a wet solution now, okay, so if you listen here, they're talking about steam heat. It is gone in, um, in, at 176 degrees if it's steam heat. Now, in a wet solution, phytase is destroyed at 131 to 149 degrees Fahrenheit. So wet solution, the temperature is lower. Steam solution, it's a little higher. Um, and that's why, you know, if you ever consider like a dehydration process where it's low, slow, continuous heat, it, it works amazing um, when dealing with phytic acid. Okay, question therefore, how to break down phytic acid, individuals may ask. Some people say, uh, we need to soak it. Um, uh, and remember this, so heating, fermenting, as in bread making and sprouting can destroy phytates. However, the method of destroying phytates in grains or legumes that we recommend is low, slow, consistent heat for several hours. Okay, so you'll find that out in the market, a lot of people may use um, soaking, heating, fermenting, as in bread making and sprouting. But that is not the instruction that was given to us. The instruction that has been given to us in terms of its destruction is low, slow, consistent heat for several hours. Now, here's the quote that you have heard me mention over and over again. We are told here grains used for porridge or mush should have several hours cooking. So um, the question is, what is mush? Okay, and we look up the word several. Okay, so let, let, let's look up here. Several. More than two, but not many. That's the new Oxford American Dictionary. More than two, but not many. Now, Saints, let me ask you a question. How many of you have read over this simple statement and did not realize the amount of science behind this statement? You know, probably most of us, you know, if you start to think. And the word mush, what exactly is mush? Now, it's a thick porridge, especially made of cornmeal. So what would you call it? Cornmeal pop. Carmel porridge, you, you know what I mean? <laughs> you can't act for anything else, Carmel porridge. Now today, you, you look and you see folks saying that their Carmel porridge is cooking just a few minutes, five, ten minutes. How can you, you cook the hardest grain known to man in five, ten minutes when technically speaking, that grain should be allowed to cook anywhere between maybe even five, six, seven hours? You, you know, so... You, you wonder why so many deficiencies are taking place today. Um, it goes back to proper preparation. If things aren't being prepared properly, you're going to have some problem. Listen to this. All grains, including legumes, and you know legumes are called legume grains. So legume is a part of the grain family. Keep that in mind. Even though botanically, it might be called leguminosae, and then your grains are called graminae. In the end, legumes are called legume grains, and when combined, we have something called a complete protein. All grains, including legumes, should be cooked for at least three hours. This is required to break down the phytic acid and other toxins in, in the bran, which, if not destroyed, prevent the absorption, watch this now, of copper, zinc, calcium, iron, magnesium, and the enzymes for digesting what? Protein and starches. Now, saints, I don't think you guys realize what this just said. Let me, let me take you a little further step. You know that people keep saying, oh, if you go um, vegan, um, you're going to be deficient in vitamin B12. 
Uh, That's not a correct statement. And we're going to show you quotes over and over to show that that's not a correct statement. But let me show you what they don't understand, which now if you understand, you'll find out why they make the statement. They don't know why they make that statement. And I'll help you to understand why that statement is made without proper understanding of proper preparation of grains. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you guys a story. You, know, you guys know I always have a story for everything, right? Um, while I was a teacher at Wildwood, there, um, a board meeting was called, and all the physicians, including myself, I'm not a physician, um, I'm studying naturopathic medicine, but because I was one of the advanced teacher at Wildwood, I, would also, I was also called into the meeting. And we began discussing strategies as well as issues um, that was out in the industry or challenges that we were having as individuals in terms of teaching the message. And one physician came up and she said, listen, every vegetarian needs to take a supplemental vitamin B12. Another physician who believes strongly in the spirit of prophecy, he stood up and he says, no, that's not correct. That's not what the servant of the Lord says. And he took a firm stand. And, and I'll tell you something, saints. I love that physician. That physician at one time was over Grady Hospital in Georgia. Very, man, very solid physician. And one of the things he, he says, you know, whenever he's dealing with natural remedies, natural remedies don't come natural to him. The drugs, because he practiced medicine for so long, as soon as an issue comes up, the drugs already come to his, na- to his mind. He has to think twice, you, you know, to try and remember which herb because the drugs come so easy because it's the language. That, that medical uh, 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 industry, it's a language. They speak a language. As soon as you go to the hospital and you m- mention, I have this, oh, the, ev- every physician knows the drug. Why? Because it's a language, okay? So it's just like us who deals with the natural remedies. You come and you say something to us, we already, already know which herbal agent to direct you to because that's our language. Okay, but going back to the story now, that physician that I'm talking about, he had became vegan vegetarian, and guess what? Lo and behold, he became deficient in vitamin B12. And you know what he did? He's like, he couldn't understand, he couldn't explain why going on God's plan made him deficient in vitamin B12? He, he did, I remember in the meeting, because I jumped in into the conversation also too, um, and I was listening, and I actually jumped in and said, we need to follow God's plan. Whether or not we find people are becoming deficient or not, we still need to exercise faith. Um, not realizing um, where the issue was. And I'm going to tell you guys where the issue, because... I continued to study it, and the Lord revealed that answer to me. And I'm going to show you guys where the error was. And, 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 and I'll tell you. So he stood on the Lord's side, even though he became deficient. He took the supplement and continued on the Lord's side. He never wavered in terms of following the program the way the Lord outlined it. Dr. Agatha Trash, she also took the position on the Lord's side she became deficient also too, but never understood why she became deficient. Since late, years later, I continue to study. And as I continue to study, more and more understanding um, I, I keep running into. And right here, the, the, see this quote right here? The enzymes for digesting protein and starches. Saints, I want you to stop and think for a moment. Listen good. In order for vitamin B12 to be absorbed, vitamin B12 needs a protein by the name of the intrinsic factor. Come on, saints, you didn't hear me tonight. In order for B12 to be absorbed, vitamin B12 needs a protein by the name of the intrinsic factor. And follow me here, saints. If you're eating these whole grain breads, these items, and they're not properly prepared the way the servant of the Lord tells us they need to be prepared, 
guess what happened? All of a sudden, you'll find that you'll become deficient in copper, zinc, calcium, iron, magnesium. Watch this. The enzymes for digesting protein and starches. So if you start getting low on the enzyme to digest protein and starches, then you're going to also, what's going to be affected? Your muscles are going to be affected. Um, and what else will be affected? Um, your B12, your B vitamins. So you're likely to become anemic. So I honestly feel that one of the cause for the deficiency that Dr. Agatha Trash and that other physician had ran into, what, had, what they had ran into was at the time, the grains not being fully prepared is one thing. And the other issue was, was um, leaky gut, uh, which is something now that we have a greater understanding of, which um, at the time that I was at Wildwood and I would visit Uchi Pines, they never talked about uh, um, probiotics. So I know it wasn't something that was being recommended. In all of the recommendations that I had seen while I was there, or even after I'd left, at no time did I ever see a probiotic recommended during that time that I was there or shortly after when I had left. So one of the things that I know, leaky gut was one of the issues of the B12 deficiency, and the other cause was improperly prepared grains, uh, simply because the whole grains were being eaten and not being prepared properly as we have been told in the spirit of prophecy. Now, let's continue here. Now, here is a, a list of phytic acid. It kind of gives you an idea of where different foods fall in terms of their, their phytic acid level. Okay? You have brazil nut. Brazil nut comes in at 1,719 um, milligrams per 100 um, edible gram. Cocoa, um, you, you know, uh, this is the thing that the Lord tells his children to stay away from because one of the things it has, it has something there called teobromine that acts just like caffeine. If you look at it, it ranges from 1684 to 1796. It is the highest on the list. So you'll find that many of our ladies, they like what? A woman's best friend. They like that chocolate. So if you find that you are a chocoholic, guess what? You are likely to be deficient in all those nutrients that I just mentioned because of the high level of phytic acid that it contains. Brown rice. Okay, look there again, 1,250. Oat flakes, 1174. Think about it. How many of you guys eat raw oats every single day? How many of you guys cook your oats for five minutes? When Sister White says, grains used for porridge or mush should have several hours cooking. Look at that. Okay, almond. Look at almond. Almond is strong. One, 1,138 to 1,400. And that's why it, it, it says, care should be taken, however, not to use too large a portion of nuts. Look at that. Um, walnuts way up there. Um, peanut roasted with skin, 952. Peanut ungerminated, 821. Lentils, 779. Now, saints, are you beginning to understand this thing? Do you understand why I said that, this, that there's so much science in this area that I had to stop and say, let's wait until the following class, and we're going to continue, because this thing is deep. Okay. There are several methods that Sister Nash and the team have come up with um, that they have found very effective in helping individuals with the destruction of the phytic acid. And, I, and I'll share some of those methods for you. One, you can bring to a boil three cups of water, Add one teaspoon of the pink Himalayan sea salt. Add one cup of rice. Oh, let, let me repeat that again. Cooking brown rice, this is the first method. Bring to a boil three cups of water. Add one teaspoon of the pink Himalayan sea salt. Add one cup 
of rice and bring it to a boil again. Lower the heat and let simmer on low heat for at least three hours. So basically, you're going to bring, listen good, bring your water and salt to a boil. Put your rice in, bring it back to a boil, and once it comes to a boil, you turn it down to the lowest setting and just let it simmer right there and it will not burn and it will cook um, for the full three hours and it will be done perfect every time. Method number two. Um, you can toast the dry rice and, and it's not just dry rice. One of the things that our team tends to do, we toast everything. We'll, you know, we'll put rice on one shelf, we'll put flour, flour like um, wheat flour, um, you know, um, cornmeal, uh, you can name it. All the different flours and grains and everything, we stick them in the oven and we toast them. And not only do we toast them, when we bring them out and they are cooled, then we put them back in their container and we label them. Now, saints, by doing what we are suggesting, you know what, what's nice? You destroy all low-level microorganisms that tends to be found on these things like little bugs or eggs or anything like that. And then you destroy all of that. Because remember now, we're buying better grains. Our grains are organic, which means there are no chemical, no pesticides, nothing in there. So they will have the eggs. They will have the, the, the little things in them that are likely to hatch um, with the right temperature. So by doing what we are suggesting, the low, the, the, the low slow, continuous seed, for at least three hours, it makes all the difference in the world. So it, if you watch what it says here, it says toast the dry rice in the oven at 170 degrees or even lower, um, um, 170 to 200 degrees. And you and I know that if you can stay below the 170 degrees, that we can actually still maintain the enzyme um, in it to, to assist us here. To, to help neutralize the phytic acid. And if you listen to what it says, it says do it for just two and a half hours. You're like, why just two and a half hours? Because later on, when you come back and you cook your, your, your rice, you normally cook rice for at least 30 minutes. So the other 30 minutes will make up your three hours. So if it's oats now, and you're one that tends to do your oats in five minutes, then you'd have need to toast it for the full three hours. So keep that in mind. Okay, here's another method. Um, you can do, and this is a baking method, okay? You can do seven cups of water, three cups of rice, one teaspoon of the pink Himalayan sea salt, put all ingredients in a baking dish, and bake at 300 degrees for three hours. Um, be sure to watch how fast the rice is cooking and turn the temperature down if it's cooking too fast. Cover the dish and remove cover 30 minutes before the three hours is finished. Now, one of the things you got to do, you got to know your oven. Some people's oven are extremely fast. Some people's oven are medium. Some people's ovens are slow. If, your oven, if you find that the oven is very fast, then you're going to need to turn down that temperature. You can't go at 300 degrees because you're going to run into some problems. Um, cooking oats. Old-fashioned oats should be cooked slowly for at least three hours to make sure that all the starch is broken down. Um, toast the dry oats in the oven at 170 degrees to 200 degrees for two and a half hours, then cool and store for later use when, um, when it would be cooked for another 30 minutes in another meal preparation. So if you know that you're not going to cook it for the other 30 minutes, then you need to take that up to the full three hours. Um, if you're doing granola now, uh, it's up to you. You can partially toast it for maybe about two hours if you're going to just to bake your granola for one hour. So you can kind of have some fun, but you want to at least use the three-hour method. Okay. Um, as you can see here, we have three different items, but we use as many different items as possible, and we try to utilize the oven space. If we're going to toast item, don't just go in there and turn on your whole oven and toast just oats alone. Try to, to, to make it a habit to utilize the oven space that you can maximize the amount of gas or electricity that's being used.
Okay, cooking beans now. Um, we have a special recipe here, as you can see. Uh, basically, you can use this. We use this like in a slow cooker called a crock pot. Uh, basically, five and a half cups of water, two cups of basically any type of beans or peas, one teaspoon of onion powder, one tablespoon of onion powder, one tablespoon of garlic powder, one tablespoon of Italian seasoning, two teaspoons of the pink Himalayan sea salt, one teaspoon of cumin, one medium fresh onion, diced small, six cloves of garlic, um, or as many as you'd like. You'll find that the more garlic you add, it gives that kind of peppery, fiery um, taste. I can tell you um, what chef does. Chef does not put her onion and garlic in right away. Chef wait until um, it is cooked overnight on the, in the slow cooker, and then she'll go ahead and season. So she, chef will cook it with the onion powder, with the garlic powder, with the salt um, for the overnight cooking. But in the morning now, what she will do is go in and put all of her seasoning, her onions, her garlic, and things like that. Right, her fresh, fresh seasoning she puts in the morning. Her dry seasoning she put in overnight. Um, place first seven ingredients in the crock pot and cook for six to eight hours. Add fresh onion and garlic after the first two to three hours of cooking. Um, chef don't do the first two to three. She just do it the next day, put it in, and then let it go on for a, a short time again, and then it goes to warm. So in that way, you'll have that fresh, nice um, taste going. Benefits of legumes. They're rich in protein and fiber, packed with vitamins B1, 2, 6, niacin, and folates, which actually is good for the nervous system and skin. They reduce cholesterol and triglyceride. They also help to cause the blood vessels to relax. Um, so in that way, you have better blood flow to the heart. They combat iron deficiency like anemia due to the rich content of iron, copper, zinc, and other trace elements. Um, they're excellent for diabetes, very, very low glycemic index. They reduce the needs of insulin and diabetes. They play a major role in reversing and preventing diabetes. Uh, they lower the risk of gallstones because they promote elimination of bile salts through the feces. Legumes are high in potassium and low in sodium. They're great for individuals who have high blood pressure. Now, summary on preparation of phytate-rich food. All grains and legumes should be cooked for what? At least three hours or more on low, slow, um, consistent heat. Okay? Says I'm going to pause right here. I'm going to pause right here. Um, but one of the things that you'll find that when we come back, you will find that with the bread now, when Sister White talks about putting the, the, the flour together, you're going to see now that she says, hey, add the rye to the flour to make the bread. And the reason being, she said that, you'll find that rye has a tremendous amount of phytase, which is the enzyme to neutralize phytic acid. So when you combine rye with wheat and oats, Rye actually helps neutralize the phytic acid and allow you to get more of the nutrients out of the bread. I hope this information was helpful to you this evening. And I'll tell you, um, just take your time, keep an open mind, and you sit back and watch the glory of God.